Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, apologies for uh, slight technical hiccups there. It's what happens when you go away for a few days and come back and try and uh, get the IT to work on the morning of the conference. Anyway, I'm Keir Fitch. Uh, some, I guess quite a lot of you have, would have come across me in my previous capacity until the end of last year as Deputy Head of Cabinet to Sim Callas, the now retiring uh, um, Transport Commissioner. Uh, since the beginning of January, I've moved to a new role as Head of the Research Unit in DG Move uh, with responsibility for transport research and hence uh, in particular for Horizon 2020 which has just been mentioned. Uh, but what I want to talk to you about briefly this morning is not just Horizon 2020, but following on from uh, the, the last presentation, what we're doing at a European level to try and leverage the kind of work you've been looking at with Sintrofa to really see how we can actually help uh, stimulate regional connections and thus ensure that they have the positive impact on uh, economic growth, which we all believe is a key benefit of them. Um, well, if you look at the programmes that the Commission and in particular the Transport DG have brought out over the last couple of years, uh, we are absolutely convinced that uh, investment in network infrastructure is vital to the long-term economic health of European regions. Uh, you see this most obviously in the, uh, the two major programmes that were agreed as part of the overall uh, financial budget settlement for the next seven years, the so-called MFF, last year. And there we have two key programmes, uh, one of which is Horizon 2020, and I'll come on to that in a minute, but the other of which, which is also important as being a really very substantial pot of money, is the 10 Ts programme. Um, now, uh, this graph uh, shows you the level of connectedness of different parts of Europe. Uh, and the effect that that has on GDP as we see it. Uh, so very clearly uh, in the most connected parts of uh, Central Europe, uh, a very positive effect on GDP. And as you get more and more to the peripheries, uh, GDP falls by anything up to about half a percent simply due to lack of connectivity. Uh, by the time you get down to southern Italy, the easternmost regions of the eastern member states, uh, bits of uh, southern Spain, etc. Uh, so increasing connectivity is vital to the European project. Of course it's vital to what Europe is in any case uh, because I mean, Europe is a, a single market, a single economic area, an area in which we enjoy free movement of individuals but also free movement of services, goods, etc. And without good connectivity across Europe, those promises, those vital uh, political parts of the whole European project simply aren't delivered on in practice uh, for uh, many of our citizens. So boosting connectivity is key, uh, was key for Sim Callas as a commissioner coming from the, the far northernmost, well not quite northernmost, but uh, very north and certainly very f uh, furthest eastern uh, parts of the community in Estonia. And also for him the idea of our future programme was to ensure that we really corrected the uh, historic errors, the, the division that still is found across Europe in the transport networks uh, from the old uh, uh, Iron Curtain, even 20 odd years on. So, um, what are we doing over the next uh, uh, seven years? Well, I'll, I'll come on to the actual network itself. Uh, but one thing we're also trying to do, which builds very much on what you've just been hearing about, is to ensure that as we build new networks, as we use the large sums of money which we have available for the, uh, the new programme, we actually use the innovative ideas which many people have sitting in the university and laboratory, um, maybe in the prototype in the company, but which for various reasons simply don't make it into the, um, the reality of our networks across Europe today. And of course, particularly in the area of rail transport, we've seen that there are huge issues. It's an area where Europe has been very strong in the past, but we're actually bringing uh, not only new investment, but new ideas, innovation has not happened. And that has a very serious drawback, because we're also very well aware that our 
rail systems, our rail systems, our tram systems across Europe are extremely expensive to, to build and maintain and to grow for the future. And yet, as you've seen from the Transport White Paper that we published uh, two years, just over two, no, almost three years ago now, in fact, uh, for the future to meet our vision of decarbonizing European transport while at the same time building a system that actually can support the, the long-term economic growth that we hope for. We vitally need that rail transport to play a much bigger role because it's inherently more uh, fuel efficient, because it is uh, very easily possible, or with degree of investment at least, uh, to make far more intensive use of much of that network. So it's vital to the future, but it simply won't work if we don't get new technology into that network and running at a effective uh, cost. So what we've done with the, the new programs with Horizon 2020, which is the research program and the Trans-European Network program, 10T, is to try and build a bridge between them. What we've seen in the past is a huge problem where we spend a lot of money, or relatively large amount of money, in the research programs. We get what we think are good ideas, but they don't get delivered in practice. And the question is why? Well, the, question, the, the answer is always, and particularly with network industries, the chicken and egg problem, how you actually make the large-scale investment to have new vehicles running on new and revised infrastructure. So Horizon 2020 plus 10T include two elements that dovetail. Uh, the first, which is what you can see here, is that uh, for Horizon 2020, for the research program, we've put a much greater emphasis for the next programming period on uh, the deployment of large-scale demonstration con um, um, concepts, uh, so that not only are we going to have the small-scale things come up through the laboratories into very small-scale deployment, but there will be significant sums of money available in Horizon 2020 uh, to actually really finance uh, demonstration projects live somewhere in Europe. That's all well and good, but of course demonstration projects are still demonstration projects. And so we've included within 10Ts also uh, the possibility of using the 10T money itself, the Connecting Europe facility, uh, to take one step further and go from the demonstration projects to actually simply using 10Ts to fund innovative solutions on the trans-European networks. So taken together, we believe that, that we're still working out the detail of precisely how this will work, but taken together, the, the, the hope, the strong belief is that actually this will really deliver systems which can allow us to get these new technologies into practice rapidly and effectively across Europe. So let me say a word about Horizon 2020 itself before we move much further. Well, Horizon 2020, of course, is the European Union's flagship uh, program supporting research and innovation across the whole of industry and across the whole of science. It's a very large program. It's not quite as large as the Commission would have liked, uh, but nonetheless, it's uh, 70 billion euros plus for the next uh, seven years, uh, certainly for transport, uh, which... I think later on I've got the figures. Um, yeah, we'll go to that one now. Uh, transport is a very significant part of the work program. Uh, just under 10% of it, 6.4 billion euros for the, next ten year, uh, for the next seven years. And that's an increase of something like 50% on what we had in the previous program for transport. And of course, this is the EU contribution. Uh, some of it is paid through 70% uh, grants when we're looking at innovation or 100% for uh, the, the real research, but quite a lot of the money is also spent in a manner where we uh, actually try and leverage money from industry, from the private sector. So the overall value of the program for the next seven years, uh, probably for transport alone, is getting on for 10 billion euros. So very, very important, we hope, to uh, ensuring the development of the sectors. Now, as I said, uh, Basically, the research program has three priorities. Uh, one is the very pure science, uh, excellent science, as they call it, that sort of supporting particle physics, uh, uh, sort of the cutting edge of biology, uh, the giving individual grants to outstanding academics across Europe. Uh, perhaps not directly relevant to us uh, in the transport area, but still 
very important for underpinning the overall quality of research in Europe. Uh, the second element of the research which is relevant, albeit indirectly, to transport is industrial leadership. This is about targeted research in areas such as nanomaterials, new materials, other cross-cutting areas uh, which we believe U Europe should have a leadership in and which then go in to support the work we do in the so-called societal challenges. And going back to this slide, you see the societal challenges cover uh, a wide range of areas where we think it is vital that we promote research to deliver benefits for our industry, for our citizens. Again, not only transport, although transport is very important, but obviously health, obviously food security, obviously things such as dealing with uh, uh, climate change, uh, the, the challenge of uh, ever reducing amounts of raw materials in a, a world with an ever-growing population. Now, as I say, this is a big increase in the budget, although it's not quite such a large increase as uh, we wanted. Uh, we've also tried to deliver it in a way that uh, overcomes many of the problems that people have discussed with the European Union's research programmes in the past, where they've been seen as overly bureaucratic, as far too difficult for many researchers who would like to be doing research rather than uh, doing uh, bureaucracy to actually use. So the, the new system is, we hope, simplified in a way that will allow us still to show that, of course, there isn't fraud and that there's good value for money, but actually allow people to get on and use the funds effectively. But the second innovation, and this is one that, again, coming back to our topic today of looking at connecting uh, urban areas, is extremely important, is that in transport, we're using a lot of uh, so-called joint undertakings or joint technology initiatives to work with industry in actually promoting uh, the development of the technologies. Uh, we've already had several that have been working su successfully uh, in the aviation area, uh, but in the area of uh, rail, and this would include the tram systems, it's for all uh, track-based transport, we're in the process of setting up a new structure called shifter rail. And this will triple the amount of research money available for the railway network uh, from about 150 million euros over the, in the past uh, programme to more like 450 million euros uh, for the next seven years. It will bring together some of the infrastructure managers, so Network Rail from the UK, Traffic for Care from Sweden. It will bring together the big rail and tram manufacturers, the Bombardiers, Alsen of this world, and it will also incorporate uh, scope for all the, uh, the smaller players, the many SMEs who are important in the industry, the university research departments, all to come together to work on a range of connected programs, uh, for everything from the, sort of the very high-speed rail, but to the tram systems, to the very low-cost innovative technologies, uh, which we were hearing about in the previous uh, session. So this is real money, a real huge increase in money available to uh, we hope to deliver the challenges of the future for light rail, for heavy rail, and for the cities. Uh, just very briefly, because we're running out of money, of course I mentioned 10 T's, uh, sorry, we're running out of time, not money. <laughs> I was just testing if you're away. Uh, um, the, the 10 T's I mentioned before, uh, this is a very large increase in funding as well. Uh, it covers not just transport, but uh, energy and uh, broadband, i.e. telecoms as well. But the vast majority of the money is in the transport field. Uh, 26 billion, uh, which uh, is a very big increase from the past. It was 8 billion before, as you can see. So uh, we've pretty much doubled the amount of money available for uh, Western Europe and included an extra 10, 11 billion for Eastern Europe. Now that is spent mostly on these nine core corridors. Uh, quite a lot of the money is earmarked for very big projects, sort of tunnels under the Alps and so on. But it's also important for cities because the cities, the big cities, are the hubs of the network. And there again, for the joining up of the local services and the, the long distance services in the cities, uh, the tens will again provide funds. And that's both the innovative funds I was talking about earlier, but also funds simply for building new necessary infrastructure. And the vast majority of the TENS funding 
is again focused on rail-based modes. So again, it's focused on the things that we think can deliver most readily both the economic and the environmental benefits we see for the future. Uh, that just gives you uh, some idea of uh, the fact that again we're focusing the funds most on the areas where uh, economic development is poorest and therefore the, the need for European funds, uh, the return we get from them is greatest. Uh, just a, a quick slide on cohesion policy. Uh, as we said in the previous slide, a lot of the money is focused on the poorest countries, those where cohesion uh, is vital. Um, but we've also, with the new policy, tried, and perhaps this doesn't fit quite so easily with the last session, but we've tried to avoid what's happened in the past, that a lot of money was provided and it got spent on uh, projects that were of local interest, uh, perhaps of interest to national politicians seeking re-election, but which didn't deliver value for Europe as a whole. The whole purpose of the new uh, 10T policy, the purpose of including that 11 billion uh, from the regional, previously from the regional funds in 10Ts, is actually to ensure that we direct at European level the creation of those networks so that we, we build the missing links, we eliminate the bottlenecks which are slowing down the, the growth of transport across Europe in the way that we all want. So I hope I've just about kept to my time. Uh, plenty more to discuss there, but uh, a brief introduction to where we are with Horizon 2020 and the 10Ts. Thank you. Thank you.